actually know these guys. And so uh, uh, they're good friends of mine. And I think we're, it's an awesome morning. I think you're going to learn a lot this morning. I'm thrilled to have these guys here. Um, so we're going to have Dr. Bob Martindale, and Dr. Ryan Hurt. They're each going to give a, a different piece. Uh, Dr. Martindale is a professor of surgery at OHSU in Portland, Oregon. He's the director of hospital nutrition services. He got his PhD. This guy actually understands all the biochemistry and all the things that we kind of gloss over, our eyes glaze over, and we fall. So he actually understands all that stuff and has described much of it in the past. His PhD is in biochemistry from UCLA. He did his residency at Madigan Army Medical Center in Tacoma just recently, right? Bob? Oh, yeah. Just finished that recently. Uh, and then he was at Augusta at the Medical College of Georgia for many years, and uh, now he's at OHSU. You probably know him from his publication in the 80s called ATA3 Structure and Function, a new subtype of amino acid transport system. So yeah, I know you're already all probably fully aware of him. And then, so that's the surgical side. And then the medicine side, we've got Dr. Ryan Hurt. Now this is the second time that Dr. Ryan Hurt has given surgery grand rounds, believe it or not, with the last being, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. He did his residency and PhD here at University of Louisville. Uh, he is, oops, let me get this right, a, a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester and the vice chair of research in the Division of General Internal Medicine. You may know him from his work on the late Pliocene and early Pleistocene rodents from the northern Badlands. Uh, so I think we're all, we've all read that one at one point in time. Uh, and so we are so lucky to have these folks here. I do want to tell, let you know we've got multiple visiting fellows. They're sitting over here. We've got Dr. Correa from uh, University of Arizona, Dr. Katz from Montefiore, did I say that right? Medical Center. We've got Dr. Lai from UCSF, Dr. Park from UC Irvine, Dr. Tandon from University of Alberta, and Dr. Van Zandt from University of Florida. So welcome to all our visiting fellows that are in town. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, we're going to talk about surgical and nutritional management of short bowel syndrome with Dr. Hurt, Dr. Martindale. Dr. Martindale's first. Okay, thank you. No problem. No. <laughs> oh. I won't tell any stories about Keith over the years. We've been dealing with Keith for about 13 years now. We've had this uh, fellowship for nutrition, and Keith we, was our first fellow, and, uh, and then we kept him on as faculty because we needed some help. And so, and he, so now he's still stayed on and actually has learned a lot of nutrition over the years. So we forced it into him. But anyway, uh, thank you for the invitation and thanks for coming down. I, I was here many, many years ago uh, and gave Grand Rounds, I think in this very room. I remember the, what they're talking about, probably nutrition things. But anyway, so today I'm going to talk about short bell. I uh, deal, uh, this is why I work, uh, I've been out there to the west, our complex, have we got a pointer here yet? You can see here, we're on top of a hill. It's interesting why we're on top of the hill in Portland, because we overlook the city. It's because in 1911, the guy bought it with the idea that they're going to need lumber in San Francisco, because San Francisco is rapidly growing. So he, he bought this uh, property. He was in New York, investment guy. No one told him that it was on top of a hill. And so he, when they send surveyors out to do the surveying, they said, man, you can't build a railroad yard on top of a mountain. And so they, he donated to the state for four times what he paid for it in tax write-offs. So he actually made a lot of money on it. But anyway, the state then took it, and we, we built a TB hospital up there in the early 18, the early 1900s. And then we've since grown. Now we're pretty big. In fact, we're the biggest surgical residency in the country now. We graduate 13 chiefs a year. So it's a pretty big uh, group. Uh, Tech Baylor, Texas, now it's going to join the other one. But we actually grew, outgrew the hill. They won't let us build anymore on the hill because of access. So we started building down by the river on some donated property, and then we built this tram that carries 75 people each time it goes. It goes back and forth every two minutes. So now we have most of our new hospitals going up down here, and all the medical school. We moved the medical students down there, and they whine about having to ride the tram, but you can see it's a beautiful ride. There's Mount Hood in the back, but every morning it got listed by NPR as the best commute in the world to go to work. Said nobody takes a tram to go to work. This. So anyway, that's where I work and where I've stayed in the last six, 19 years now. So anyway, <clears throat> we'll talk about this concept of short bell. What can we do to prevent it first? We say, well, 
you know, always, I think a second look has become very common, very routine now to say, look, this looks bad, but let's wait. Let's not take anything out. Any more out today, just come back. The other thing is saving much of the ilium as possible is another key, because the ilium is really much more important than jejunum. If you've got a choice of jejunum or ilium, certainly save ilium. Ilium is where the, the uh, you know, the uh, GLP-2 receptors are, highest concentration in the last 15 to 20 centimeters. Also, the ileus ego valve serves as sort of the break. Uh, helps with the break. So save, you need at least six centimeters to make a function of the ileocecal valve, so try to save at least six centimeters of distal ileum. Be extremely cautious with anastomosis early on if there's size discrepancy, been obstructed for a long time, and you've got big bell, so into small bell, that's where lots of leaks are. If you look at the post-op leaks, that sets you up about four times higher than equal size bell anastomosis. A lot of consideration is, you know, when do you make, if you got multiple holes in a bell, when should you say it's not worth saving the intermediate piece? You know, it's, it's got four anastomoses versus three in an ostomy. Really be careful with deciding of throwing away viable bell. That's a big issue because you can end up with short bell, then we got more problems. So bring an ostomy versus, versus a, a colonic anastomosis in the face of a contaminated field, that's another tough one. If you bring out a Jajan ostomy, and they're putting out four to five liters a day, you've got yourself set up for a long problem. And then when did we restore continuity? My goal and what I try to tell people, I'll hook you back up if you can keep with your diet and your you know, con compliance on this at about three to four liters. More than that, you destroy them. They become 20, 20 stools a day, 25 stools a day, and significant you know, perianal excoriation and they'll come back to you saying, please make the colostomy again. Please bring out my ostomy. So that's a big issue. Now, how do we look at that? Again, second look is always a good plan if you're in worried at all. But also, you know, the old fluorescein woods lamp still works. Obviously, that's well perfused. And put fluorescein in woods lamp, and that piece has got to go. You know, so it helps you and lets you see really. And a lot of times, we'll, we'll take off right at the edge there and come back for a second look. And then we now use spy technology, you know, where you, it's uh, indocyanin in green, mixes with albumin, essentially binds the albumin, and then you can do real-time blood flow analysis. I'm sure you guys are doing that too. Plastics uses this a lot, but we use it for bowel and osmosis with dead bowel. We even have, we can even get it out in the middle of the night nowadays. It used to be only when there were people were there that could run it, but now it's pretty much easy to do. And then sometimes we'll use combination with IR, we'll put a catheter, and if we were clotting something or a bleed and they clotted something off, we'd leave the, have them leave the catheter in. So when we go there, we're only going to take the piece that's really bad. You can see here, this is infused with methylene blue while we're in there, in through their catheter, the IR place. And we can see we got that piece there. It's got perfusion because we just in, injected it. We can see where it's perfusing, what's not perfusing. So it works pretty well in trap. So if you think about what should we say after we've got a patient, we've taken a bunch of bowel out, we've you know, taken several segments, they got transferred to you and they had five operations before they got to you. The key things what we need to know <clears throat> when we're dealing with that, and you guys being a referral center, I'm sure you're getting these patients, is we really need to know what's left in there so we can manage the, the situation post-op. How much are we expecting to have here? What's our output expected to be? Not really what was taken out invariably, you read the app notes and they go, we took out 40 centimeters, and two days ago they took out 30, and the operant before that said we took out 160. And you're trying to put together how much do we actually have left. With CT interrography today, we're better at predicting, so if you're, whatever there's a question, or, or do you have short bell or not, CT interrography will really help you. And that's a good way to look at it. And then you also, for Medicare purposes, on getting TPN, long-term TPN, lifelong TPN approved, You've got to know how much value you actually have. So, and Ryan will talk about that. So, also dictate which segment was removed is the proximal gut and give landmarks 30 centimeters in ligament trites we resected, whatever. Number of anastomosis required to restore, required to restore continuity, so we know what to expect. And then also, was there dictate, was there difficult areas of dissection? I, we couldn't go into the pelvis because it was cement. You know, and so they just leave that so you know next time you go back. You're unable to or unsafe to determine the length. If someone, you know, you want to leave how much you got left, but you can't tell because it's so socked into the pelvis, but the bowel goes down there and comes out, wasn't obstructed down there, wasn't injured down there. Just say that. 
So the next guy that goes back can know what he's getting into, or what she's getting into. So what is the etiology now? It's changing. You know, when I first started doing this 25 years ago, we had a lot more Crohn's, obviously before the days of the monoclonal. So we had a lot more Crohn's problems. We had, we had more malignancy. We had, still had some old radiation from the days we did mantle radiation. Those are pretty rare anymore. We rarely see the radiation fistulas in the small bowel. Right now, we're looking mainly at you know, bariatric misadventures. We see a lot more thrombosis SMV because as obesity goes up, factor V light and all the other coagulation issues. So we see a lot more SMV thrombosis. So uh, synthetic abdominal wall mesh, erosion, mesh erosion. I think that's become my life. I do about one fish of the week nowadays and probably half of those are from synthetic mesh erosion into bowel. And it's almost always, I shouldn't say almost always, but probably very commonly is our dual meshes where you've got Gore-Tex with polypropylene together, which are very popular. And Gore-Tex shrinks 25%, polypropylene shrinks about 8%. So what happens? Polypropylene, the Gore-Tex shrinks quite a bit, then exposing raw polypropylene to the bowel, it sticks to that, and that invariably erodes into a, a fistula. And then neoplasm, again, not too common, unless it's like desmoid, you took out a big chunk, and it's year after year, you take a couple more chunks. So these bariatric misadventures, there's sort of a regional, you know, there's all sorts of bariatric procedures done. In our Northwest, we've got some sort of crazy bariatric surgeons over the years. One guy lived in Eugene, Oregon. I probably operated on about 30 of his patients. He called it the salmon procedure, being in the Northwest. And he basically took the stomach Stapled here, stapled here, stapled here, stapled here. I've actually talked to him, he's retired now, and I've actually talked to him, I go, what gave you the idea that was gonna work? Because now the food had to go down and go back and forth and back and forth. And he said, he goes, you know, when the salmon have to climb the salmon ladder, you can see they get exhausted and they just stop and wait for a while before they jump to the next one. You know, when you see the dams on the Columbia River there, I go, really? You know, <laughs> he goes, yeah. He goes, it's really where people lose weight. Oh, yeah, it takes them four hours to digest, you know, a sandwich, you know, so because it's going back and forth. But the, the one I really love, which we actually, the only time I've ever made a complaint to the Washington State Board was on this fellow, uh, Dr. Heap from Kennewick, Washington. I call it the lunatic procedure, okay? So what he did here was he do a sleeve. This is before the days of sleeves. He do a, he still does until he lost his privileges. He actually was doing these. He does a sleeve gastrectomy, takes an NG tube, forms an NG tube band around the middle of the, of the sleeve, basically, and puts it in there and sews it in, and he charges them for a band, okay? Then he knows that people do fine with 100 centimeters of bowel. So he measures 50 centimeters from the ligament of trites, goes to the illicical valve, measures 50 centimeters back, throws out all the middle part of the bowel, and sews it back together. And it's a disaster. People have hundreds of stools a day. I had several cross-country truck drivers that were obese, wanted something done. They come in now and they, of course, have to stop every hour to drive. They, they're out of business, basically. So luckily, we got his privileges. That's the only time I've ever made a complaint, and we finally got his, his uh, license taken away by the state of Oregon. Reoperative bariatric surgery, very high risk. You know, and then there's other, the conventional one, biliopancreatic has the highest risk of reoperation and then complications because they have a very high risk of protein deficiency with biliopancreatic, bili much more than a gastric bypass, rule in one. And then, of course, I'm sure you've all seen the internal hernias that were produced by the rule in wise. When they come in, they've lost 150 pounds of adipose. And basically, the internal hernia, now you've got a big Peterson's effect, so you come back with dead bowel there. And they're missed commonly. Not a problem to have the hernia, but when they're missed and they've got dead bowel, that's the biggest issue. They send them home, they go, oh, you're throwing up a little bit, be fine, come back tomorrow, and they come in with, you know, 250 centimeters of dead bowel. So, so when you, the question was the synthetic mesh, uh, this one actually is a, was a gunshot wound, but these are all mesh fistulas. There's a, this is a big problem, because once you're in there, you're stuck to the synthetic mesh, you can't get it off, you end up with multiple fistulas, and these were all sent to us. Uh, except this one is a good job. But, you know, then you got synthetic versus biologic. The benefit of the biologic, it rarely causes fistula, but of course it's much more expensive and, you know, it doesn't quite have the re you know, resiliency as far as recurrence rate 
but synthetic meshes are really a disaster once they started rolling the bell. Probably most of my fishes now are coming from synthetic mesh, uh, you know, erosion of synthetic mesh. So clinical presentation, you know, we look at that and we said, you know, what do we look at there? So what's going to make a difference, extent of how much you removed, what was removed, all the common things to think about, the, the presence or absence of the ileocecal valve. Remember, they already mentioned that GLP-2 cells are right at the distal ileum, the very first couple centimeters of colon mostly distillum, that's where you're going to get GLP-2, that's where endogenous GADX, as we know GADX is, is a peptide with an arginine glycine residue change to give it a longer half-life, and it gives you a little longer half-life, a daily drug, whereas endogenous GADX will go up if undigested nutrient is sensed in the distillum, that tells the proximal bowel, it gets stimulated by that proximal bowel, then hypertrophies, and Ryan will talk about that. Uh, the degree of adaptation, we know we can adapt over one to two years, but if you have endogenous GLP, you'll adapt over three to four years. So, uh, you know, the textbooks will tell you two years, but at three to four, we're still seeing people that are decreasing their TPN will start to grow. Basically, you'll see less and less TPN, so we can know we're still getting growth. Worry, we worry about bacterial overgrowth, usually come from stasis when the bowel dilates. For, you know, as the bowel dilates, as they have more and more short bowel, they get bacterial overgrowth and dilation. And then we see gastric hypersecretion from resections because you've lost your negative feedback on the, on the stomach. So how does that look? You know, what do we present as? Diarrhea and satyria, volume depletion, these are the big issues here. Electrolyte abnormalities, magnesium being the hardest to catch up with on these short bowel patients, significant weight loss, and then zinc being the most common trace mineral we lose. So, and Ryan again is going to talk about that. Now, what's the true prevalence? Ryan and his group, uh, Man Creek Monday, published a nice paper, about 25,000 people in the United States now on TPN secondary to, to uh, <clears throat> short bowel. Really, that's a tough estimate because a lot of them don't get recorded as short bowel. I think the estimates vary so widely because the whole idea of who's on TPN, when they're on TPN, how long they're on TPN, depend on who's paying for the TPN. And that's the issue. Well, we don't know a true prevalence, and we know really no estimate of how many people are requiring hydration only. We can almost always, if you've got 60 or even 45 centimeters of viable proximal small bowel or ileum with adaptation, you're going to be fine nutrient-wise. The problem is hydration. And so many of these people are routine hydration. We give them TPN one or two days a week, and then they get hydration the other days. And so we transition from Nutrient requiring a parental nutrition down to, as Ryan, I don't want to steal this thunder, but basically required to, to just hydration. So, and these Ryan will go over, but basically you got three things. With the NJ genostomy, the probably the hardest to manage, easy to follow, but hardest to manage. And these, uh, where you got jejunum to connect to the colon, that is a great uh, chance for recovery and coming off parenteral because basically the colon becomes an absorptive organ. You go from Normally, average American diet, we're getting about 150 to 200 calories from colon absorption of short-chain fatty acids, fermentation from fiber, soluble fibers. When we get this situation, the colon literally becomes up to 500 to 700 calories per day you can absorb from the colon with the right diet. So that makes a big difference, five to 700 calories. When you look at that, if it goes, you can go up to maybe even higher than that if you really push the diet. But also, there's new data showing that some of our protein absorptive capacity with PEPT1 transporters being upregulated in the proximal colon, so we can absorb protein from the colon. So I always look at the colon as the afterburner of the GI tract, you know, because it really saves us from these patients. Uh, what are the procedures? You know, if we look at that, preventing intestinal re or preserving intestinal remnants, serosal patch. Use serosal patch as an idea rather than you know, with stricture plastic, you're worried about that, put a serosal patch on, you're not losing bowel that way. Recruiting unused segments, you know, bringing ostomy takedown, but again, remember, looking at the outputs. Internal fistulas, take care of those with just local care, usually. Preserving functional peristalsis, you can taper or imbricate, I'll show you some pictures of imbrication. Bowel lengthening, the classic operations here, usually start in pediatrics, now we're seeing them being done in adults. Uh, Bianchi and step procedure. We'll talk about those. And then delaying transit time, reverse segments. I've done a few of those and I probably won't ever do it again. 
They don't ever work, you know, they just never work. Lots of data, they don't work, okay? Pseudo valves, people who actually make internal valves, they got the idea of the Coke uh, pouch and things, they don't work either. Uh, colonic interposition doesn't work. These are more ideas that really never came to fruition. So here we have the general consideration, ileostomy takedown clearly is great only when they're out, when their control of diet and output of the right through the, what they're going to see. If they're under three, over three liters a day, they're going to come back and say, bring out that ostomy again. I can't take five liters a day out my rectum of liquid and bile. Uh, so you, and you see, you know, this is for a stricture plasty. Here's our invocation. This actually works pretty well in adults. You can actually just pull together a big dilated loop. Remember, when you got a loop this big around, it can't when a pair when it contracts, it doesn't push the bowel, uh, push the content, the bowel content in an aboral direction. It just sits there and squeezes like this. So by imbricating now, you can start to get a little more contraction and start to get some movement. I've done a few of these, and they you know they work okay. They save you with having to try to figure it out because these procedures, the traditional lengthening procedures, are tough. These are where this is the, the Bianchi procedure where you actually come down here, you split the two mesenteries and run your stapler down the middle. And this is a step procedure, a much more rational, but a lot of a staple lines. And you worry about leaks in those staple lines. So here again is a Bianchi where you, you've got a big dilated loop of bowel. You separate that mesentery, each goes upside and then you staple down the middle of them. And then you move them, usually do a 90, you know, in the in OGIA 90 or 90 centimeter, uh, 90 millimeters, and then you pull those out and sew them together. So you, you're just going from basically nine centimeters at a time, segments you make it, and you can go pretty far. And you can even do a redo Bianchi uh, at a later date if you need to. So again, lots, most CPs starting to be done in adults because we're seeing more of adults. This is a classic lady, we've done the most recent one, Bianchi on. You can see she gets admitted routinely with pneumatosis, but she'd be sitting there doing fine. Of course, everybody sees her in the ER, go, oh, she got pneumatosis, she got dead bowel, we got to rush to the ER. Oh, why? And go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I know this patient, don't worry. She comes in every couple of months like this. And so then when you get rid of the pneumatosis, because they're sitting there looking at it, going, Doc, why are they making me not able to eat? You know, <laughs> so, but there, she does fine. Once we get rid of the pneumatosis, we went and do a Bianchi procedure on her. We've actually done two now. She's done very well. She's now 28 years, 25 years out. So, step procedure. Again, this is where you serially, a serial transfer of sinoplasty there. You can see, very nice. It works very well. It's like an accordion. And see what the problem with the handles here now is now the, the fluid does go back and forth like this, but you save the mesentery is a big key. You never injure the mesentery whenever possible. Another picture. So basically, you go from standard straight, trying to get directional flow of the food, and then you end up with this, and it works. It stays. The key is keep in contact with that mucosa, the absorptive surface. If we look at the short bowel procedures, you can see over time, we really started seeing them go up in 2002, and they've about leveled off now for procedures done. Most of these are kids. It's actually data at Harvard. Now, other procedures, again, I told you don't really work where we used to take 10 centimeters and reverse it, with the idea it keeps that, you hit the segment and pushes back and goes back and forth. Doesn't really work. Uh, you hear, read a lot about them. The literature talks about them. I tell you, unless you're really stuck, I wouldn't try it, because you end up losing more bowel. Colonic interposition, where you piece of, put a piece of transverse coal in, in the small bowel. Again, you get stasis, bacterial overgrowth, lots of pneumatosis in that remaining piece. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're really stuck. The neo valves, well published again, doesn't really work too well. The experimental models, I love this one here. The recirculating loop, you know, guy reported six of them and never saw any report of it, but didn't report it. Uh, retrograde electrical pacing, uh, we tried pacers for a while. We had a protocol with Medtronics. We were doing pacers, trying to get retrograde pacing in these, put electrodes on the bowel and retrograde pace. Uh, we never had much success. They they wrote a paper. There was five centers doing it. They wrote a paper saying it was successful. Our, our patients were in there, and we didn't have any of the success. So I'm not sure where that came from. So uh, neomucosa. This has got some potential here. Where they actually take the patient's mucosa, grow it in sheets, and move it on there. So that's got some potential. They use these collagen backbone 
and then basically grow this mucosa onto that. Uh, vascular is a problem. They put epidermal growth factor and trying to get vascular growth factors in there. A little bit of a problem. Intestinal lengthening. I put this only because it's been in the literature and now been reported in humans uh, and kids where they say it saves the blood flow to the bowel. I can't see how that really saves the blood flow. So I put it in here just because it's been reported. I've never done that one. So what do we talk about as we finish up here? Really age, length of the remaining bowels are key. Remember, time for adaptation. If you've got native ileum, your light really can take that 402 years to three to four years for adaptation. So I think it depends on GLP-1, GLP-2. Many people argue the newer uh, derivatives are going to be combination of GLP-1, GLP-2, it looks like. Brian will talk about those. Remaining functional bowel, intestinal dilation, that's a key. That's a good patient for a Bianchi if you've got big dilated loops or a step for us, and then bacterial will grow some nutritional status. I would not try any of these unless they're truly nutritional replete. When to operate, you know, after full potential for regeneration is gone. Remember, the problem is using that nutrient is transit time. So tailor our management to keep the food in contact with the remaining absorptive surface as long as possible. That's what we tailor our management for. So. So after full potential here, again, I mentioned GLP derivatives, derivatives, dilation of the bowel, again, if that's a good candidate here because you've got big dilation, all you got to do is either by step, by Bianchi, or by imbrication, you got lots of options there for fixing those. Uh, and then, if not, small bowel. Uh, what, when to consider, you know, who's a candidate? If you've got over 25 centimeters of bowel and adequate hepatic reserve, that's a good candidate to manage with surgical options. Less than 10% of the bowel left, about 50 centimeters, well, with an illegal valve is a good candidate. I think Ryan has a case of that, you know? Okay, and then under 20%, 100 centimeters without an illegal valve, again, becomes a candidate because they're gonna get dilation. And then fail attempts at GLP deriv to GLP derivatives. Who's not a candidate, as you might expect, anybody malnourished to very elderly, you gotta look at risk benefit ratio, People over 60, 65 don't do well with their adaptation. It takes a long time. You have to really consider that. Advanced liver disease is lean more towards transplant, and then small bowel criteria are very low. Just a couple of sentences on small bowel transplant. Here's our options for small bowel transplant. We don't do small bowel transplant. I have several in my clinic. The University of Washington or UC San Francisco used to do it. I'm not sure if they're still doing it. But you, you know, we can show one year survival for small bowel transplant is about 85%, 65%, five year. Nowadays, I look at the only indication for small bowel transplant when we failed our attempts at parenteral. Look at the five year, this is the 90% five, one year survival, five year survival, probably 85%, 80, 85% for TPN. So the only real indication is to go off the other direction. Uh, the indications for small bowel transplant are surprisingly loose. I think they keep that that way on purpose. If we look at the number of transplants, remember they came into us early, and in 2000, you can see they continue to go down. The number of transplant centers are going down, so it's, it's really a changing time. Uh, we're seeing less and less done. We're seeing the older and older people are getting going to transplant. It used to be almost exclusively a pediatric operation. We're now seeing adults getting transplant, but fewer and fewer are being done. So I think that's good. So summary then, what can we say? The number of patients getting small bowel uh, surgery for short bowel are increasing. Ryan will give you those numbers. There's more adults now. It used to be mostly kids, but now we're keeping adults live with small segments where you're going to have to manage. They're going to be in your clinic. The true number difficult to determine. Those getting hydration is the reason. Transplant now only considered when people fail uh, parental nutrition. That's when you start thinking about transplant. Fewer number are getting liver involvement, which is great because we have our new lipids. We have SMOF and Omega Van, which give us the benefit there. Nutrition must be arranged before a surgical attempt. Always make sure malnutrition is corrected. GOP2 derivatives may change the playing field. I think I'll leave it to Ryan. Let's see if I can figure this out. Mm 
That looks good. All right, well, th thanks. It's uh, kind of a lot of flashbacks here coming and presenting surgical grand rounds. I did this in 2006 as a medicine intern, and it was a little contentious amongst the house staff and surgery, but uh, Dr. Garrison, my mentor, uh, allowed me to, to present with him. So it's a true honor to come back. I was a research tech in Dr. Garrison's lab, Department of Surgery, so I'm a proud uh, alumni of surgery in, in some way. Dr. Garrison, obviously, in the audience as well. So a lot of, lot of great mentorship here for me uh, in the surgery department over the years. Um, Dr. Richardson, uh, and I'll, I'll show a quote from him during my grand rounds, uh, was really profound as far as some of his statements about uh, parental nutrition. Here's my disclosures. Uh, we'll skip right through those. I want to kind of go back to this case throughout my talk. It's a very interesting guy. He, he let us uh, present his case and uh, former football assistant coach at the University of Minnesota, 31 year old, came in history of anxiety, depression, nothing really major um, past medical history wise. He came in, he had persistent melanoma, had a sequel AVM that was diagnosed, was admitted to have an IR embolization. Well, that just didn't sound good to me, uh, letting the IR people do, do something like that. So uh, he was observed for a few days, uh, tolerant regular diet went home. The problem is he came back with an acute abdomen. Um, emergently, emergently transferred to the university hospital and they found that basically all of his bowel was gone. All but his duodenum, a little bit of uh, jejunum and uh, Part of the colon was left. Everything else was dead and removed. They thought he had hit. Uh, that's what he probably had, and he had an SMA thrombosis. So here he is in the ICU. Um, obviously, really sick guy, but young. Um, and you can see, you know, basically ICU for, for prolonged course. Um, and here's one of the, the things that's interesting about his case. So the surgical team, the first surgical team, came in and basically recommended palliative care and hospice for this individual. And the reason they gave was low quality of life on long-term PPN and not likely a transplant candidate as Bob just went. And this, Keith used to tell me, this used to be the correct answer on the surgical boards. And so this, this is what I'm going to go through and show you why maybe that's not the correct answer nowadays. So I'm going to talk about HPN, home parental nutrition, show you the differences, show you why uh, this quality of life isn't so bad on home PPN. Um, I'm going to go through some of the pharmacotherapies that Bob uh, mentioned, as well as the nutrition. That's my, my job is nutrition. So as Bob alluded to, the defining the normal length of the GI tract, you know, is something that, that we always try to do. I always think about 600 centimeters of small bowel. Um, and men, it's a little bit more, women a little bit less, and we have about five feet of colon. So it's important as, to remember the physiology as you uh, think about how to take care of these patients. Bob went through these three types. Uh, these three types of short bowel basically really help dictate how we can uh, treat them from a nutrition standpoint. As, as Bob said, and it's very important, this is the point I'm going to make sure that the surgery, uh, members of the surgery field know that we have to have what's left in there. Your best guess is, is better than nothing. So Medicare defines uh, short bowel syndrome as 152.4 centimeters, five feet. It's kind of absurd because short bowel is really a clinical diagnosis, but that's how they define it. And so I always tell the, the surgeons, please, Keith Miller, please, when you're in there, I know it's hard, they're edematous. I remember seeing a lot of Dr. Garrison's patients when we were doing DPR, you know, edematous, the bowel is edematous, but if we're going to get long-term TPN in these patients, we need to know how much is left, right? Often, as, as Bob was saying, often you'll get a little segment here, a segment there, but what's left in there? Now, if you can't get us what's left, the imaging's much better nowadays, but we can also use citrulline. Citrulline is almost exclusively produced in the enterocytes of the small bowel, so it's a nice marker that we have. This is a meta-analysis that they looked at, all the studies that looked at citrulline uh, in short bowel patients, and it's, it's a pretty good indicative uh, uh, marker of intestinal insufficiency. There's Dr. Garrison. So citrulline, uh, is, here's the data, just shows that Citrulline really uh, correlates very well with the amount of small bowel that's left um, in short bowel syndrome. Our patient, back to him, he only has four, uh, and again, less than 20 really indicates intestinal failure. He doesn't have much bowel left. He's got 20 of jejunum and a little bit of duodenum. Dr. Garris, we used to do d xylos which is another test you can do to look at um, you know, the bowel uh, function as far as intestinal failure. We used to do that out in Building 19. 
So how do we take care of these patients nutritionally? Uh, there's three different phases really we think about. The first phase is that acute phase after you've done the operation. The fluid demands are very, very high. Electrolytes or losses are, are large. PPN is always required in these patients. You've got the gastric hypersecretion that Bob talked about, so H, H2 blockers and PPIs are used. We get a central line and then some, some will place a PEG tube too. We know that if you feed these individuals, they do better enterally, orally, so you have to initially uh, hold off on that, but oral intake is done after a few weeks. Um, and, but TPN is still the mainstay, and it all uh, depends on what, what's left, what length is left, uh, but TPN is the mainstay of treatment. And then eventually, as Bob was talking about, I'll show some slides on adaptation, uh, you know, one to four years, depending on the situation. So intestinal adaptation, what happens is you get lengthening the GI tract through increased diameter and increased uh, villus height uh, over time. So the villi grow. Um, and they also have hyperplasia, the enterocyte. So you get more cells. Uh, it does take, you know, one to two years, as Bob's saying, this can be extended depending if you have some ileum left. Uh, and it requires nutrients too. That's the other key is that's why we always make sure we're either feeding these individuals with oral nutrition or enterally supplementing their TPN. And Bob talked about native GLP, and I'll talk about uh, the new medications that are out. So this is just showing the time after a section, the amount of uh, infusion that's required. And you can just see lots of fluid infusion in the first few weeks, and, and after 10 months, you don't have as much. The cool thing is the colon adapts as well. So as Bob alluded to, the colon does adapt. This is 12 patients, small number I know, but the crypt depth is higher. The number of crypt cells is also higher. But apoptosis and natural adaptation doesn't occur. But the colon actually does uh, change, which can be very helpful, as I'll show you here in a second, on our patient. The value of the ret retained colon, not only is it adapting, uh, but, you know, having that colon is very important for fluid, right? If we hook these patients back up, it allows us to get their fluid balance under a better control. This concept of colonic salvage, the bacteria in the colon can actually help produce short chain fatty acids. You can actually get 500, but sometimes in some cases more uh, of kilocalories absorbed through uh, short chain fatty acids, which is great. And I'll show you how that applies to our patient here in a bit. Bob mentioned PEPT1. Uh, that's the other thing that happens in these short bowel patients. You have I mean, uh, dye and tripeptides actually get absorbed at a higher rate this is a study, it's an old study, but 33 controls, 13 short bowel patients had mucosal biopsies, and the abundance of these PEPT1 transporters were five times higher in the short bowel patients. So my summary in this is colonic salvage, so getting that uh, bacteria uh, producing some sh short chain fatty acids, and this enhan enhanced PEPT1 can increase caloric absorption in these patients, even in patients that have basically no short bowel left. So back to our patient, uh, as Bob says, you got to get the you got to get the flow uh, under control as far as output goes. He uh, it, it basically I brought all his data to the surgeons and I said, look, can we reconnect him? Because he was in discontinuity. His duodenum jejunum was uh, not in continuity with the colon. So the surgeon said, okay, as long as you manage the diarrhea, as long as you manage the output, you know, uh, we'll we'll do it. We'll hook him up, and he's coming to your clinic uh, after that. <laughs> So I said, like, okay, we'll do it. So uh, this guy went to my high school too, so it was like I was going to help him out no matter what. Uh, but you can see here when uh, by the time he was discharged from his surgery, he, he was actually his output was uh, under pretty good control. We had him on a modium, we had him on a special diet, which I'll go through. We had him on oral rehydration solution. PPN formula here though is 2,500 kilocalories, seven days a week, right? He's on daily PPN. Um, if you if you think about one number you can always remember, if you want to know what their caloric requirements are, roughly estimating their Harris Benedict, just remember the number 25. So 25 times 107 kilograms gives us approximately what his resting energy requirements are. So you can see we're underfeeding him a little bit. BMI is 31, so we decided we could do that. What determines if you're eventually going to uh, get off of PPN, it really is whether or not you have that colon, uh, colon intact. Uh, versus no colon. Uh, if you have no colon, um, a lot of these patients, you have to have about 150 centimeters left to even get, attempt trying to get them off of TPN. But if you have that colon intact, like that patient I just described, you have a better shot. Now, he's never going to get off TPN. 
right? Because he has basically no small bowel left. So these are my main, when they come to my clinic, when the surgeons send them back, uh, what we talk about is diet, oral rehydration, antidiarrheal medications, and I'll show you some of those novel agents as well. And obviously if needed, TPN. Not all these patients eventually, a lot of them can get off TPN. They go back and forth sometimes between hydration and TPN. Uh, but our goal is really to get that stool ostomy output down. I'm not going to give you a dietitian lecture, uh, but I love the dietitians in this case, utilize them. Uh, we talk about low osmolarity, low free sugar diet, and I'll go through that in a second. Small frequent meals, uh, limit simple sugars is one of the keys here. Complex carbohydrates versus simple sugars. That can make all the difference in, in these patients. So sometimes we think about colon absent presence, and, and, and but you can see there's not much difference. If you, again, we're talking about colonic salvage, feeding those carbohydrates to the colon, you get a little bit more uh, when you have colon present versus colon absence and the fat differences, but virtually we treat these pretty, pretty similar. What are some examples of low osmolarity diet examples? All these things you can see have low simple sugar. The simple sugar has an osmotic effect in these patients, and so we really, target food items that have low simple sugar with them. Dr. Fleming, who was uh, before me at Mayo Clinic, used to talk about the fire hose. If you feed these people simple sugar, it's like a fire hose coming out or a, a water slide. So you can see the osmolarity. Everybody knows what prune juice does, right? Everybody that's elderly and constipated say, I'd take some prune juice. What happens is it's an osmotic effect, right? It will absolutely go right through them. And it's, it's very hyperosmotic because it has lots of simple sugar. So you can see are just different examples. And so a lot of the short bowel patients that come to my clinic are doing, you know, orange juice, soda, you know, and, and those things just exacerbate the, the losses. Also foods though, think about foods. This is one thing the dietitians actually don't know as much as they should about it. I tell them, don't do the prune juice, do the strawberry ice cream. It's as, it, will, it will take care of your constipation better than prune juice will, right? It's, it's much more higher in simple sugars than even prune juice. So you really have to focus on limiting these food items in these patients. So we have the diet, but also oral hydration. That's my next uh, topic that I talk about with these patients, right? This is physio I'm PhD in physiology, thanks to Dr. Garrison. So we know that this glucose transport going against this gradient with the SGLT1 uh, mechanisms will drive uh, the sodium chloride in and take water with it. Right, so it's glucose, sodium, and osmolarity are the keys to the fluid that you're going to give these patients orally. The recent paper that's nice, and the keys here: glucose in these solutions should be between 20 and 40 grams per liter. Sodium should be between 45 and 90, and slightly lower osmolarity. So these are solutions that are medical grade hydration solutions that your short bowel patients should be on. You notice there's no Gatorade on here, and I'll show you that in a second. We like some of these things like called drip drop. It's a commercially available, uh, it tastes pretty good. And I'll show you a study we did in a second. Here are some ones that aren't appropriate for rehydration solutions. You see Gatorade's at the top of the list, old Gatorade, right? Has higher amounts of glucose and some of these solutions have no glucose. So when, when people say, just take a salt tablet, I say, well, that doesn't have any glucose in it. It's not gonna drive this mechanism, right? You need the glucose to drive that gradient to get the water into the to the vasculature. So uh, hydration solutions that don't have glucose are problematic. Zero or lower than optimal sodium in these solutions too. Here the chicken broth had a ton of sodium but no glucose to drive that sodium and water into the cells. So we did a study to taste. If you try to taste Pedialyte or feed a kid Pedialyte, they'll say, I don't like that, right? So we did a study where we we're gonna, okay, take the best tasting stuff and, and make our homemade oral rehydration solution and randomize patients. And so we did that and we just really looked at compliance. And so what we found was basically our homemade solution, we did just as well as far as mean number of days uh, that people uh, would uh, take these. These are short bowel patients, really small study. And it actually probably was driven by this guy over here. Uh, and I'll show you a slide in a second on him. But our recommendations sip one to two liters of a medical grade oral rehydration solution throughout the day, right? Allow that hydration solution to gently get into the bowel uh, or the colon and get absorbed. This guy, as it turns out, when we ended the study, he was in our arm where he was, where the solution we made, and he loved it, right? So he would just say, 
hey, this stuff tastes great, you know, and so he probably drove those results a little bit, almost to statistical significance for the, our homemade stuff. So that's the problem with small trials. So my next uh, few slides are at, uh, talking about med medicine. So you'll see these uh, often uh, put on people with short bowel or high ileostomy output. Lopiramide, Imodium, Lamotol, and Tincture of Opium are the three that we use on this list. Often, a lot of the surgeons will try octreotide. It, it either works or it doesn't. It's uh, keeping that on if it's not working for more than a couple days is not really something we do. Here's our protocol, though. Um, so one of the keys behind these medications, just think about it. If they have short bowel and they're taking pills in, they'll often tell you, I see the pills in the toilet, right? Because it's going right through them, like that water slide uh, effect, right? So what you have to do with these is uh, take the modium, crush and mix them with sugar-free applesauce, have them take it 30 minutes prior to the meal. Prep the bowel, slow the bowel down, prep it. Uh, and you also do it at bedtime, too, because you'll have a lot of these short bowel patients will have nocturnal awakening and, and stool there. You can also add Lamotol to the modium. You can combine them. They're synergistic in our, in our experience. And the third line is tincture of opium. I usually don't have to get there, but through this combination of medications, you can slow that uh, movement through the bowel down, allowing optimal contact of nutrients and fluid with the bowel. So Bob mentioned GLP-2. There's new, new, a new class of drugs. Gaddix is the, the trade name. Right, and so what Gaddix, the, the analog does, not the natural Gaddix, it does improve fluid absorption, decreases secretion. We showed, this is our study, it showed that we uh, decreased gastric motility, uh, which was a study we did in 2015, and increases GI blood flow, which always interests me, dating back to the Dr. Garrison days, but also impacts the colon uh, Crypt cell and, and apoptosis, which I said earlier, the natural adap adaptation doesn't do that. So a good class of drugs. The problem with it is right here, $200,000 per year for uh, GADX, right? And if you actually look at the, the data, so this is the pivotal trial, 173 patients. Uh, they had a 4.4 liter reduction in the GADX arm and 2.3 liter in placebo, right? So a net decrease of two liters per week for that $200,000 a year. Only, four, only seven out of 173 actually got off TPN. So it's not something that's gonna get patients off. They may get them off a night of TPN, which is a big deal to them, but at a huge cost. One of the things that I found interesting, this just, this just came out in clinical nutrition, and this was a, a using Gaddix for a fistula. Bob talked a lot about fistula, AC fistula. This is a, rant. This is a crossover trial where uh, a small number of patients got either standard of care and then crossed over to Gaddix. And then they had a standard of care a month, and then they had a long-term follow-up. And what the, the primary endpoint was decreasing EC fistula output by greater than 20%. These are, these are low-output fistulas, 200 mils per day. So they were put on that Gaddix, uh, that GLP-2, for 56 days. And what they found was five out of six achieved the primary input, endpoint, which was get, you know, decreasing the output by 20%. One of the fistulas closed spontaneously. Another two were, they were able to close surgically at the end of the study. So if you do the math, I mean, at least for two months, this is a little bit better and maybe something we can look at for fistulas in the future. So we tried our patient, back to my case, we tried him on Gaddix, even again, because all that colonic adaptation that we had uh, seen in, in the basic science studies. Um, he stopped after basically a month because he had had abdominal pain, which is a common uh, side effect of Gaddix. And so we tried and it didn't work. So, so really my summary on Gaddix and, and the GLP-2 is it's about up $200,000. Home TPN costs $150,000. And if you, very few patients gain independence. So really what you're doing is you're, you're adding probably double the cost to these patients to the healthcare system for that net decrease of just two liters. Um, there are new uh, agents in, in, in the pipeline, and they may have some uh, price-lowering effect with a little competition because Gaddix is basically uh, uh, N of 1 as far as the medication goes. Now, the exciting thing, back to Dr. Cheadle's patient. I was talking to Dr. Cheadle earlier. He had a patient that is on Gaddix, you know, didn't do great. But GLP-1, the GLP-1 class of medications, which helps with that ileal break uh, along with the ileocecal valve, um, and, th and this is something that I think is exciting. Uh, this, this may actually be a very helpful for these patients, right? So it slows gastric emptying, slows things down. 
Uh, we trialed here. He had one. He had nausea after one month. Um, but here's the limit. There's limited data on this right now. Um, but there, there are a number of trials uh, ongoing looking at this. This is a, not, a small case series of just five, five patients with short bowel. And what they found was after 30 days, you know, basically three of these patients actually got off TPN. I don't know if I necessarily believe it, but it's a small N of five. But the nice thing is the cost here is 782 bucks a month. It's a lot less uh, than, than Gaddix. Maybe be, may, it works differently, but it may be effective. So future state of these, these drugs, you can certainly uh, trial these uh, GLP-1s, but we need larger trials to see if they have benefit. Well, the GLP-1 that I showed you may help with EC fistula closure. It may be worth a trial there. Um, there's two new agents in the pipeline, so hopefully we can re reduce that cost. GLP-1 and GLP-2 combination is a, is a strategy that I think that's really going to be helpful in the future. I'm not going to bore you with a vitamin lecture. I told myself not to do that. I had medical school. I said, I'm not going to bore you with a, a vitamin lecture, just a couple, two slides. Uh, but in these long-term patients, I do check B12, folate, A, e, all the fat-soluble vitamins. They're usually low in these patients. I get a soluble transferrin receptor instead of a ferritin. Uh, this actually doesn't respond to inflammation like the acute phase ferritin does. It's a nice receptor. I get zinc, copper, and selenium because those, those will be low. There's vitamin shortages in these patients right now. And so you can see this is his most recent labs. I pulled them up and I'm like, oh, I got to respond to this. Copper and selenium, as Bob was saying, low in him. He, we've had some vitamin shortages, so he's only been getting every other day vitamins. So we need to increase those in him. So you got to really monitor these patients pretty closely. The one that the impact on uh, the bones is, is probably the main vitamin consequence in these patients. Uh, this is this is from our data. It's old now, though. But 56 of uh, the long-term HPN patients short bowel had metabolic bone disease. It takes us 50,000 twice a week to get his to get their levels therapeutic on average. It's a lot of vitamin D, right? And the problem is these patients have. I'm not going to give you a medicine lecture either, but this is metabolic bone disease, right? So this is a year after his his ischemic event. Uh, his Z score is negative 2.2 shifted in that normal curve of, uh, of bone density. So he's already headed to osteoporosis very, very quickly. You got to get these, uh, these bone densities in these patients every year. Because you can see he was sliding. If he got negative 2.5 standard deviations from the mean in the bone density, that would have been osteoporosis. So you have to, you have to be very careful with these patients and quickly uh, react to this or else they'll have fracture. This is them doing their TPN at night. My last slides are on TPN, so this, I'll never forget this. I was standing on the stage and I gave my lecture on how great intro nutrition was, and JDR came up here and basically said, I don't believe that TPN is bad as you let on. We've gotten much better at delivering it and preventing infections before they become life-threatening. That's exactly what it said, I'll never forget it. It was seared in my brain a little bit. So my last talk is, I wanna show you the quality, so back to that early case where the quality of life was an issue and they wanted to do palliative care. Home TPN is not as bad as, as you think, okay? So it can be life saving for these patients. And I, as I show you, uh, we do this at night, right? And so here it is. So instead of the hospital 24 hour infusion that he was getting, we'll actually do this nocturnally in patients. Same nutrition, nocturnally infused. So run it at night, hook up at night, disconnect in the morning. He's free to do whatever it is he needs to do during the day. It works. Uh, he does all kinds of stuff. I'll show you some pictures. He goes swimming. Or he's got a port so he'll de-access now one day a week. He'll jump in the pool. He's doing all kinds of things, right? So instead of that power to care, you know, pull the plug, you know, think about, you know, how we could potentially help these people. We've looked at our internal data on these massive ischemic events. We know they happen, uh, but we also know that we can put these people on TPN. And there's a wide range of comorbidities here. So I understand that I often will see them after the surgeons have saved them and basically got them to me. And so I, you know, my, my viewpoint is a little bit narrow on these, but we can, we can help these people. There's different lines for home TPN. The ones we usually gravitate towards are the more permanent lines, Hickman catheter or a port versus a pick line. And he's getting his TPN infused here through a port. We always think about the number of lumens. Even the interventional radiologist now will say, okay, I'm gonna put two lumens in and your long-term TPN patient. And this is a classic study, and it shows that every lumen you add it starts going up exponentially. These are triple lumen picks. All those eventually get removed because of infection. 
So we gravitate single lumen. We just need a single lumen. I don't need anything else. And so this has the lower rates of infection because infection is what kills these patients. So if you look at the number of, if you add all our catheterized days up of all of our home PPN patients, our infection rate is pretty low. It's lower than any hospital infection rate, right? 0.64 infections per 1,000 catheter days, right? But this is what will kill your patients that are on home PPN. We, we try to save the catheters when we can, right? So, um, so we salvage them, and I'll show you salvage slides, but uh, unless it's MRSA, pseudomonas, or fungal infection, we need to try to salvage these long-term catheters. And, and how you do that is you basically infuse antibiotics directly through the infected catheter. The treatment's 14 days. <clears throat> um, and outside these, uh, these bugs, we, we try to save these lines because what these patients are, they're like dialysis patients. And I know that's gonna give people some, surgeons get, you know, when they talk about nephrology, you get a little angst. I remember Dr. Garrison would always get a little angst on the, the vascular access issues with, uh, with nephrologists, but we treat them just like dialysis patients. This is their lifeline. And if you don't uh, protect the lifeline, they will die. Um, and so this is a patient of a translumbar. All the access up top is gone. Translumbar uh, Hickman catheter. And notice they're putting in double lumen there, which is a no-no, right? <clears throat> so these are my last few slides. So this, this case has ended up well. It's, he's well, no, he's well known in our, the Twin Cities. His brother played in the NFL. He went to my high school. Uh, and so He's well known in our community and he shared his story, which has been very helpful. He's been on TPN over 2000 days uh, from that palliative care sort of moment, if you will. Um, the duodenum, the colon was reconnected successfully. And, and since he's actually been connected to his rectum and he's, he's at four days, uh, four stools per day with that. As Bob says, these people will often get lots of excoriation if you hook them back up and they're not ready. He was ready and so we were, I promised the surgeons on that one too. I said, look, you hook it, hook them back up. I'll manage all the diarrhea and all the issues. We trialed the GLP-2 and GLP-1. It didn't work for him. Uh, that doesn't mean we won't trial in the future. The nutrition wrap up on him, it's interesting. So back to that original formula, he was getting 25 kilocalories seven days a week. BMI is 31, so we were permissively under, underfeeding him a little bit because his hair, his resting energy requirements were 2,675. He's a big muscular guy. But look at look what happened at the end here. He's on three liters. This is 2022. This is just recently. He's only getting 1428 kilocalories six days a week in TPN. This is a guy who has no, no small bowel basically left, right? So if you calculate his Harris Benedict at this new weight, you know, his resting energy requirements about 2130. Clearly the, the math here that something's not adding up and he's clearly absorbing at least 600 kilocalories, probably much more than that with that colon enhancement, which was pretty, pretty neat. These are my take home points. I won't read them verbatim, but at, you know, I always get the surgeons, please measure that bow. I don't care if it's a deminus, your best guess will help us get these patients covered for long-term life-saving TPN. We can use that citrulline test if you can't get it, but um, measure that bowel remaining when you're in there. And I know that takes time. Keith always says, like, it's not as easy as just measuring it. You know, I know that. Um, but measure it. And, and so, so certainly we want to get your patients covered. That low free sugar, low osmolarity diet is very crucial. You know, don't have them drinking prune juice and, and having uh, you know, high amounts of diarrhea. Small frequent meals. Optimize anti diarrheal medications as I showed you. Crush and mix them with sugar free applesauce 30 minutes before meals and, night, and at night. You'll slow things down much better. Those GLP 2 and GLP 1 medications I think are going to be uh, game changing for these patients. And I'm looking forward to maybe doing trials on GLP 1 with fistula because I think that, that's a nice trial that we could do that's not been done yet. And oral rehydration solution. These patients should be walking around sipping oral rehydration solution all day long. If they do that again, like the patient I showed you, he does it. He comes with, to the office with his, uh, with his bottle, he'll sip it all day long. And if they do that, they do pretty well. My big point though, and this is what I taught Keith a few years ago is, HPN is, quality of life's not as bad as you think. That guy, you saw him, he's swimming, he's active, he's working, he's done well. So, uh, so you know, don't pull the plug uh, too early, so. All right. Yeah.
That was fantastic. I'm in all of these guys. You know, we talk about all the students of surgery kind of have our presentations on these particular problems, and we have a case, one case that maybe we talk about because it's one of our success stories, but these guys both have hundreds of success stories, and, and, and they do this on a daily basis. And uh, So I think we'll just take a couple minutes to take some quick questions before we move on. Oh, uh, and then uh, we'll let Dr. Garrison get the last word here, which is great. Dr. Baldwin, go ahead. Yeah, that was great. Uh, I guess my question would be, you know, we're when you don't have the resources of what do you, what what's your advice for you know people like us that are trying to manage people like live in bath or three or three hours away in rural and things like that? Like how do you build a program that could have equivalent resources? Yeah, so I, again I, I it kind of annoys me that you know, Mayo Clinic, number one thing, as, you, as everybody knows, that's, that's, you know, that's something that's a little fiction, but um, <laughs> it's a good place, you know, but I love this place too. So um, I think a lot of these things I learned right here with Steve McClave and, and Neil Garrison, and I, my resources aren't much more different. I think partnering with the home infusion companies is key, right? So you can partner with the dietitian team, the pharmacy team there, and, and you can help manage these patients. Um, some of these things are just simple, simple things like, you know, if it comes from the physician, what I'll say is this, if you're the one telling them that it's important to do this diet, it's important to do this hydration, it makes a huge difference. Just a little time is probably all you really need to make a major difference, right? If you kind of just defer it and leave it up to somebody else, even the dietitians don't know about some of this. So if you just give them five to 10 minutes of your time, I promise you that will have a huge impact. And I'm not kidding. I mean, I spend time with these patients and I, I tell them this is important. And once you, that kind of sinks in to some people, there's some people we have that up there that are non-compliant, just like down here. Right. And so I think time and having these things come from the physician, I think are, are game changers. Yeah, I would agree with that. We're like, like you guys, we're not a big Mayo Clinic, you know, Ryan came as one of our fellows and came to our clinic and saw we do fine. We have one dietitian. Now, when I was chief of general surgery, I can, can control the finances. So I actually hired a dietitian for our clinic. And to me, that's been the best money I ever spent. Even a step down, now we're saying we need two dietitians in the general surgery clinic, you know, for these patients. The day that you see these patients, have them in the clinic. That makes a huge difference. And then they you know, manage your home TPM patients. You know, we have about 31 home TPM patients this month, and you have 140. We, we do that with one dietitian, one good pharmacist, and a good nurse. And a good nurse doubles as short bowel nurse, as fistula nurse. So you can do it with limited resources, but you can do it and take good care of them. And so, I, Matt, you got my, I mean, just give me a call too. I, I, I don't see Dr. Glandiac, but I mean, I, I've answered lots of uh, queries from, from uh, UofL. I'm more than happy to do that. We got our nutritional guru here, Dr. Steve McClay. Steve, you have any questions or comments you want to make? The cost of GADX uh, at this point through the pandemic is nearly double what you were showing. Yeah, so it's 400,000. 400,000 right 400, 400, a year. Yeah. Yeah. I want to... It's just almost prohibitive. Are there any populations could get the GADX? Yeah, that's what I was trying to show. That's what I was trying to show that. So the population I think about, the one, if you really think about, the, I've had people get off. We did that motility study with GADX. And what I did was I looked at that and I said, who was the responder there? But who is, you know, one, you got to have enough bowel, right? You got to have usually over 150 centimeters of bowel uh, or 100 to 150. With colon and continuity really helps. You got to go through all the things I showed you. You got to have a really compliant person that's bought into that. Uh, and then it's the person that doesn't need the, the, the TPN as much for nutrition as just electrolyte management. Those are the people I trial on GADX. And, and no native ileum left. Right, no native I think when you've resected the ileum and you're dealing with jejunum colon resection, yeah. that's a candidate. And that's a window which I'll still use it. I resent $400,000 a year. And the company has told, no, we've never refused anybody. But they and have. the four or five that I have actually called them and said, look, this patient has no insurance, so, you know, whatever. And, and they go, well, have they tried this? Have they tried that? I go, well, I thought you said you never refuse anybody. You know, and they go, well, you know, we never refuse them, but they need to try this stuff first. Well, they never, never get it. I actually had a patient who I got off of home TPN. He had a desmoid tumor, and he was in that original study. Got him off of home TPN when he transitioned to Medicare. You know, they basically weren't going to cover Gaddix anymore, right? And so they, so we're stuck with putting this guy back on TPN. He got off and had done well. 
But now we got to put them back on because the effect usually wears off. Yeah, about two weeks. Uh, you get the hypertrophy in two weeks, within two to four weeks, it's back to it's normal. It's not growth hormone, hormone, right? Yeah. One more question, Farmer? Yeah, what about the presentation? What about the malignant potential? Farmer's and colorectal surgery. Yeah. Very small. Like, we've, Very we've small. had multiple patients. <laughs> Yeah, so I, that's what I didn't put. I don't want to bore you with a bunch of uh, you know warnings, but that is that's one of the warnings, obviously, with GAD is because growth hormone it has the potential potentially to exacerbate cancer. So people that have previous cancer, I usually exclude them from putting them on high risk patients, you know, high risk colorectal patients. I, I won't put history, on family history. Family history colorectal. So I think about all those things and I agree, like because a lot of people out in the community are throwing people on the, these medications without thinking about those things. I think it's probably not as high. The yeah, malignant potential it's, it's is not. It's pretty as high. rare. It's, it's pretty rare. rare. You find a rare case. You see them. They report a rare case. The problem is what just what Ryan said. They're now marketing to family medicine, and I think this is a crisis because you're dealing with people. Oh, you had a little too much diarrhea. Oh, well, you've had two surgeries. Well, let's put you on Gaddix, and now they're on a four hundred thousand dollar a year drug for marginal indications, if any. With just a little bit of emodium, better management of the emodium, timing the emodium may have been done it. And and uh, it's, I think we're, it's a problem. And I breezed through the disclosures I probably shouldn't have, that was not appropriate. I'm I'm on the Zeeland trial, which is a long-term weekly injection that's uh, that's in a phase three trial. We're, we're a study center for that. So, and it's showing similar results. When that drug gets on the market, I think the cost of these drugs will go down because right now Gaddix is N of one. When you're N of one, you can charge whatever you want. Yeah, we're on the same trial. Gaddix is you didn't once disclose, a day. You didn't disclose it. Though. I didn't disclose it. I don't have to disclose that. I'll I take know. money from anybody. Are you yeah. off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that's a, you know that's a once a week drug, and people respond much better to it, and and it may give you better absorption of nutrient than does Gaddix. So I think I'd like to put Gaddix out of business. Power work. Uh, yeah. Uh, Good question. Yeah, so that was uh, showing with the Pepti-1 transporter, so it absorbs protein, you know, a little bit uh, better than it, that's adaptation there. It's certainly that colonic salvage. So again, I've breezed through that, but basically 500 to 600 kilocalories, the colon can absorb nutrients produced by the bacteria, the short chain fatty acids. And so those are important topics, uh, you know, for a colon, for sure. Uh, it gets, it, it does better, it does better when it's short bowel, right? When it, it adapts just like the, the, the small bowel. So it does better uh, in short bowel syndrome. Yeah, undigested nutrient hitting the colon will upregulate Pepti-1. And we've got that data in animals, and now we've got early data in humans. Tom Ziegler has been a big move in that area where we actually colonoscopy and biopsy, proximal small proximal colon remaining in there, and you can actually see Pepti-1. So you know, you know, when we eat a meal now, 70 to 80 percent of what we eat is absorbed through the Pepti-1 transporter of the protein. So when you get upregulation and protein absorption from the colon, it's pretty nice. We know already that 10 percent of our leucine is absorbed from the colon routinely now. No, yeah, PPI. So the hyper, especially the hypersecretion period, we definitely use it. I try to I try to back it off in the later later patients, uh, you know, because a lot there's there's some issues obviously with chronic PPI. We don't really need it, but those early phases of short bowel, we definitely utilize it. Uh, not as much late. I think that the physiology there, as you mentioned, we get bone osteoporosis worse. Yeah. We know already that does it, so we try to get the long-term TPNers off it. But I think that if where it depends what segment of barrier loss. You know, most of your inhibition of gastric secretion is secretin family drugs, VAP, secretin, and even some of the GOP. GPY. GOP. GOP does very well. So if those are still present, you got a good chance you won't need the PPI. If you resected the proc distal bowel, you're going to need it. You're, the inhibitors of gastric acid secretion are gone. So you're probably more likely to need a PPI. Dr. Harrison, anything you want to add? How disappointed you are in her? I didn't do surgery, which he didn't talk to me for six months, but he allowed me to come back and do my PhD, which I appreciate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
back and read your physiology textbook. All of this is based on originally how things were absorbed, the management of glucose, its relationship to blood flow. For example, when, when Truman Mays 50 years ago was talking about hitting the hepatic artery for the hepatic column, he insisted that we drip glucose into the into the gene, in the MB2 in day one to increase in, intestinal blood flow and therefore increase hepatic blood flow. So he just that basic physiology 50 years ago was a management of the issue. All of that I would encourage you all to the most important course you'll take is physiology. All the other things change. So understand that to understand disease and pathophysiology and how your treatments work. Yeah, I would, I would quick, yeah, I would quickly say that when I got to do my PhD during residency and afterwards, and I was able to, it, my knowledge of medicine just went up exponentially because I restudied the physiology. I had my job because of two factors. One, Steve allowed me to follow him around a nutrition clinic, and two, because Dr. Garrison allowed me to, to learn physiology at a high level. And so this is all, I'm a GI physiologist, and that's how I got my job at Mayo Clinic, taking care of these short bowel patients, because I'm not a GI doctor, I'm not a surgeon. Uh, so I would echo all that. You learn your physiology, and, and the medicine will make sense, right? And in fact, the physiology staff st stopped, they hated me, because I was like, I would clinically correlate and be able to go back and forth. And the rule on my dissertation defense was the prelim or, uh, oral exams was, you can't clinically correlate, because we don't know what you're talking about. But I was very, I was able to move back and forth very, very well, so. Well, thank you to both. I know we went a little bit over, but I think it was worth the time having these two here, and uh, they're going to be here. Well, Ryan's got to go back, to, he's got to go back to, uh, to work. Bob's going to be with us for another week, so uh, you'll have a chance. So uh, let's give him a round of applause. We'll try to get some mint julep cups to the way. We had to go on the road. Huh? Take the show on the road. We could. <laughs> yeah, you should. You should. Sorry, I went like 10 minutes over.